morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are, everybody. Thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to this very important conference celebrating 200 years, no more, no less, of uh, animal protection in the UK. So I'm going to proceed to share my screen with you. And today I'm going to talk to you about a very important topic, which is how to actually find mechanisms to embed animal welfare within international policies. And I'm going to use the One Welfare Framework for this as an example of how this can be very well achieved. So in my talk, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about what is One Welfare. We will talk about the One Welfare Framework as a tool for international relevance. And then I'll do a brief summary of key international agencies and bodies with some final remarks. So what is One Welfare? And I hope many of you listening today have already heard of the concept and of the approach and what it is. But just as a reminder, One Welfare describes the interconnection between animal welfare, human well-being, and their physical and social environment. And those two little words are quite important. The environment is quite a broad term that can mean different things to different people. And within this approach, the one welfare approach and the definition that um, was uh, created by consultation, it was important to clarify that this includes both the physical elements of objects or inanimate things that are in, in a given environment, such as uh, handling um, tools or corridors or pens or drinkers, and also the social environment and those interactions between different animals, animal groups, animals with people, etc. So that's what is meant by the physical and social environment. Many of you will have heard about the One Health concept, which is gaining momentum uh, given the, the COVID pandemic. And of course, the One Welfare concept has its own space. So the, the key difference between the two of them is that the concept of One Health applies and has health at the core of it, whilst the concept of one welfare has animal welfare and human well-being at the core of it. And whilst there are some overlaps, it's important to actually retain that focus because many times when we talk about health and zoonosis and infection disease, the focus becomes very much on, on that animal health and human health aspect. And we risk really losing the, the welfare components and all the animal behavior, et cetera, tools that are equally important for, for that holistic approach when we think about an animal or a, a sentient being or a person in terms of considering both the health and, and welfare. So here we have the representation on the different areas that the, the One Welfare approach would cover versus those that the One, one Health approach would cover. And overall, One Welfare is helping professionals and, and everybody else really to understand and recognize those interconnections between the work we as humans do and how that connects with animals, environment, and also the wider society. And it's really helping us to highlight the impact that animal welfare work and policies go beyond helping animals. And it helps to stop suffering more widely reaching humans and society. So yes, by being a vet myself and working with animals, that doesn't mean I'm only making a difference to those animals, but I'm also making a difference to a lot of people, to societies and ultimately to, 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 our, to our world. So that's something very important to remember that that interconnectedness remains at this level as well. So the One Welfare Framework is there actually to, to basically help understand the breadth of the concept of One Welfare. Um, basically, it's a structure in five sections, and I'm going to go through all of them in, in this talk and basically explain to you some examples. So I'm hoping that you can understand the, the meaning of, of those different facets of, of the One Welfare concept and through the One Welfare Framework. I will use examples from this paper I published last year um, on, on the One Welfare impacts of COVID-19. I think there are very good examples at international level and, and reaching international policies and law through the pandemic in terms of how One Welfare uh, can have an influence and an impact in terms of embedding animal welfare within those international mechanisms. So you will see through the different um, through the different parts of the framework that I will give you examples and refer back to this paper for those that, that want to read it in full. So the framework has five sections and we're going to go straight into it. The framework is, is published as you see before in the reference. So if anyone has an interest, you can read further about it. So the first section talks about the connections between animal and human abuse and neglect. And this is really based on, on the principle that those that cause harm 
to a being, generally to say a vulnerable being to, to do that. And that vulnerability is has something in common between elderly people, children, animals, and victims, victims of domestic violence. Therefore, the animals as, as vulnerable beings within a house environment become many times test subjects for the escalation of, of this abuse or vehicles for, for the manifestation of this abuse. So this is also known as the link. So the link covers specifically abuse rather than abuse and neglect. And you can find a lot of literature references within the, the website of the Luxury Link Coalition. And you will see that this topic is increasing and is being more and more documented in, in literature, something that to date still remains anecdotal in many of the areas, but is, is improving. So it's a very important area because by, by preserving the welfare of those animals, we can actually preserve the welfare of a lot of people and even save lives. So there is a cost to society in terms of, of monetary cost. And there are already references. This is an old one from 2007, but you can find recent ones where actually yes, back in 2007, they estimated the cost of 8 million paid work days per year in terms of domestic violence. So those improvements on animal welfare can actually help to, to decrease this in a way and to actually make a quite profitable saving to, to society. During the COVID pandemic, uh, we have seen that this area has been highlighted as a second pandemic by the World Health Organization. And here we can see an example of how they reported an increase on, on violence against women in particular, and how the epidemics and, and stressful situations tend to increase this. So something quite relevant at the time with all the global affairs going on, and something very important to think about in each of our areas of work. We have seen reports of up to 700% increase of domestic abuse reports in, in different charities. And this will range across the world and across different uh, charities looking at this topic, but that is quite a shocking statistic, a 700% increase during the pandemic. So again, something important to, to reflect upon. In terms of the One Welfare approach, I would like to highlight to you that we have the One Welfare Phoenix project, which is looking very much at this particular topic. And you can find this information in detail in, in the website, One Welfare World. So I don't expect you to read it, but I just want this to, to alert you to it because this project in particular has now in place four different working groups, which is looking at this area in terms of farm animals, working animals and animals in entertainment, free roaming and companion animals. And much of the literature available at the moment is on the companion animal area. And this, this real group is really trying to unpick all that anecdotal evidence that we are seeing in all other areas and try to document it and, and, and actually raise awareness of that. And the ultimate goal will be to facilitate exchange, publication and dissemination of information best practice and experience within this area, working with relevant NGOs that, that dedicate their, their full power to that. So, so that's something that is important for those interested in this area and how it can make an impact. So the project is international and we have represented this across the five continents. And I would encourage you all to, to find further about it and, and to reach out if, if this topic is of interest or if you have evidence that you would like to share with the different working groups. I go to section two, which talks about the social implications of animal welfare. And this is quite a broad area. Again, the social implications of animal welfare can be endless if you think about it. But we have as an example, responsible ownership, something that is quite close to, to many and something very important in terms of our society and how we live our day-to-day -day lives with our pets. So again, if, if we look at the COVID pandemic, there have been quite a lot of reports about human-dog relationships or human and other animal relationships during the pandemic, how there was a boom in adoptions of dogs, for example, for many different reasons, to have the right to be able to walk outdoors or to have companionship or to have something in the home that maybe kept the children uh, a little bit more motivated with different things. So there were multiple reasons, but they're having reports across different countries, really. This was not just based on the UK, for example, but this is an international area, which was quite interesting to follow during the lockdown in particular, and also the impact that it had um, after the lockdown. And again, all of this affected not just the welfare of those animals that were locked down with the owners, that maybe after didn't have the companionship that they have had during all these years, but also the people that live with them and possibly those living around them, like neighbors, etc. 
So we can see that there were an increase thereafter of abandoned animals and, and during the lockdown. So again, there were multiple reasons and, and the timings were different in different countries. So that was quite an interesting uh, area to, to explore. And also there was cases reported where stray dogs were hungry because people was not outside. So no one was feeding them. So again, that escalated sometimes in, in danger to people coming out because this pack of dogs in, in some countries were hungry. So again, that became almost a public health risk of these dogs being hungry. Um, we also have seen reports about guidelines from the international organizations that you see here, the OIE and IUCN and the wildlife health specialist group in terms of how we can work with free ranging wild mamas in the area of the COVID pandemic. And this was very much focus to prevent a risk to, to humans, right? So you can see here that this um, controlling the exposure to risks, mitigation strategies to sort of delay, minimize the contact with those animals to assess how we handle them and to protect people. So very much a human approach. But actually, if we think about this in, in detail and, and, and looking at the one welfare approach, we can almost see that this part, it, it's equivalent to the, to the three R's. And we can actually go to the three R's. And for those that are not familiar with the three R's, this is a, a technique used in, in research, in laboratory research, where we actually try to, to help improving the welfare of those animals by replacing the animals where possible, by reducing the number of animals that are used in, in experiments, and also by refining the methods that, that are used to, to reduce animal suffering. But we can also apply and extend this to, to the COVID-19 measures when working with free living wildlife, but also we can take this forever. So it doesn't need to be just retained for, for COVID only, but we can use it at any time. So we can replace those working alternatives that do not require handling. And actually we can help them not just to pre pre preserve the public health of people, but also to preserve the welfare of those animals and those environments that we are working on. So minimizing the impact on, on environments as well. We can also reduce the number of animals and that's gonna have an impact on, on our interactions as well with those animals, with our exposure, and also with the impact on those environments. And we are talking, for example, of um, areas that are very much inhabited, for example, like jungles, etc. And, and also how we use methods that minimize the need for handling, etc. So we can adapt this to any situation, really. And I just like you to think about it, because I think it's quite a good improvement and the potential of actually considering this when, when developing international laws in terms of how we approach those animals, how we conduct different work, etc., is really powerful. So something to think about in terms of, of those social interactions with animals and, and how we do the research. And of course, we have multiple examples from, from those NGOs working with working animals and livestock supporting livelihoods. And we can see here how uh, animals working animals can help uh, women, for example, in some communities providing help, and sometimes they become invisible. So we have quite an interesting report here from Brooke that you can find on, on the website as to how those working animals and preserving the welfare of those working animals is helping people and livelihoods. We can see here how different uh, SDGs are complied with uh, and addressed really by strengthening livelihoods by caring for those animals again. So it's rich in poverty, economic growth, partnerships, etc. And again, we have a topic here about the donkey skin trade, which again is causing multiple welfare issues across different countries internationally, but also multiple issues in terms of the well-being of communities that is living off those donkeys and a lot of parallel and related issues. So there are reports already documenting this. And again, the, the relevance of law and international mm -hmm. law in terms of addressing this, this problem has become quite key in some countries. So again, something to, to think about as to how this one welfare approach and this one welfare framework can be transposed and, and, and adapted into laws that prevent and support all, all these social areas. We move to section three, which talks about the health, welfare, well-being, food security and sustainability. And this area very much focuses on farm animals. So we can see here that through the pandemic, for example, we had examples on the mink, farm mink, and how this actually raise awareness of the transmission from animals to humans and how the conditions where these animals were kept and not only impacted them, their welfare, but also impacted on how 
zoonotic diseases can transfer into humans. So again, this was quite a powerful link of one welfare, but also one health in terms of how keeping animals and the, the welfare conditions on how those animals are kept have a link in, into to humans and they're having again multiple campaigns and documentation about it. And of course, the way we keep these animals is generally ruled by law. So again, legislation and international law has a very powerful um, a context here to, to, to help prevent and, and embed welfare concepts that are going to help everybody ultimately. We have examples from FAO, from the UN, uh, as to how family farmers are impacted by, by different practices. And here we can see different examples. So here they talk about bees, camelids, fisheries. But again, uh, keeping animals has an impact on different communities. And depending on the country we are, that impact will be different. So that is important to take that into account and to take into account also the cultural differences and, and the different types of farmers and the different type of species as, and animals. But again, something important to remember and how the, the welfare and well-being of those animals are not just going to affect the animals, but also are going to be interconnected with those farmers that keep keep them. And the well-being of those farmers is going to, again, have an impact directly into the welfare of those animals. So a farmer that is unwell, that is unable to care for those animals, will have an, a higher likelihood to, to have a herd or, or a group of animals that may not have the, the care that they would need to, to keep their welfare properly. So again, it's very important not just to think of the welfare of those animals, but also of the well-being of, of the farmers and the people looking after them. We have had reports on, on other areas with, within animal farming, such as slaughter. And again, referring back to the pandemic, we can see how this has have almost like a chain effect in terms of farm animal keeping, animals slaughter, and how the pandemic affected the number of animals killed at the slaughterhouses. And then this had a backlash effect into animals building up on farms and causing all sorts of issues, not just for the welfare of animals, but also for, for the people keeping them. So something quite important to, to think about. And again, the, the reference is there for those that want to read the paper by Laura Boyle and Jeremy Marchand Ford. And then we have reports that are produced annually. This one in particular from 2016 from FAO focuses on the, the state of food and agriculture and in particular to, to secure food security and sustainability. And it's quite an interesting way to think of, of the welfare of animals and how we read these reports and we, we talk about food security, we talk about sustainability and many times the word animal welfare or human well-being just doesn't appear but it is intrinsic within the text. So that's something that we all need to learn to, to identify and to be more mindful of, that when we're reading texts about food security, many times animals are behind how that food is produced. Even if there are plants, the, the use of pesticides or the use of different crops are going to have an impact as well on, on different animal types. So again, something important to think about and how that impacts on the soil, on the ecosystems, etc. And we have reports on how sustainable practices of different types can help us reduce methane emissions, for example. And we have to be quite careful when we talk about this. This is not just comparing different systems, but actually many times this is actually when we look at one given system, improvements we can make within those practices to actually reduce the emissions within that system and increase productivity. So we have to be quite careful how we we understand and interpret this data and not to compare apples with pears, right? So we have here an example, and, and you can see that the, the percentage of, of emissions reduction are quite different depending on regions and areas. So depending on how farming has evolved, we may have more or less room to actually change those emissions. And you can see here the, the scale is quite big from 14 to 41%. And these figures might have changed already. So that's important to think about that when we talk about emissions, the context on which they are produced will be different depending on the production type, the farming production type, but also on the country, on the context, etc. And again, all of this is regulated by law many times in terms of how you keep those animals. So there is an impact here and, and, and a rule for international law in terms of having an impact on, on how to improve and achieve positive improvements in this, in this area in a continuous way. I move to section four briefly, and here I will talk about assisting interventions of animals, humans, and the environment. And here, basically, we have many examples 
of different uh, organizations and different schools that are using um, different types of interventions with animals to, to help people. And many times these interventions are human focused very much. And what is important is to take into account also the welfare of those animals and those environments where the, where the interventions are taking place. Many times, depending on the type of, of interaction, we will have trained or untrained animals. And it's important to ensure that those animals are identified, are selected, are cared for, and are appropriate for the role they are playing in those interventions. And that the care they receive and the hours they participate in the interactions is appropriate. So again, a big role here for law and an area that perhaps at the moment is a little neglected, but is it's on the grow. So something that many are already thinking about how to how to create uh, ways to to ensure that all elements of these interventions are are protected, not just not just the people. We also have examples of these interactions quite current. This is a, a newspaper clip from from past conflict in Afghanistan. And um, I mean, there are more recent examples of, of conflict where we are already hearing a lot about uh, interactions with animals and people. And here I thought this was quite an, a, strong, um, an, a strong statement from one of the soldiers fighting in the region where he was basically reporting that he felt like it may come across as he saved this dog's life, the dog that he rescued from, from Iraq and brought back into, into the UK. But he said that actually he felt he, he saved his because when he was in the war zone, the dog was that link to reality. You know? So that's something important to remember that during conflict, animals are there as well. And they are there in many different facets. And actually, one of, of them is supporting people and, and helping in, in different ways. And the welfare of those animals is also supporting the well being of, of many. The final section, section five, is not the last one because it's least important. It is actually a very important section. And it's actually for me one of the most challenging one because it has interconnections that link to biodiversity, to sustainability, to the environment that are not often discussed or, or mentioned explicitly. We can infer them from many texts, but it's very hard to find explicit text about them. So this is a, a cloud from the chapter in the book I published in 2018. And you can see that the keywords that appear here are quite different. So we can go all the way from waste management to habitat conversion, to intensification, or even extensification of agriculture, pollution, many different areas which are not often associated with animal welfare, but that do have an impact, whether direct or indirect, on the welfare of animals. And there is that interconnection that is important to keep present if we are to tackle global challenges in a holistic way. We have here an example going back to the COVID pandemic of how animals at risk of extinction were cited more often in areas where tourism was prevalent. So as tourism moved away, these animals took the space back. And this was something positive for nature that nature benefited from actually humans scaling back, we could say. So again, we can see that interaction quite clearly how we as humans are taking over spaces that generally if we weren't there would be taken by, by other species. And those interconnections are important, not just looking at, at conservation and extinction, but also looking at the conflicts between animal and human interactions and how sometimes there can be public health risks as well from those species when humans come into, into the areas. And we have heard many cases, for example, with, with elephants in, in different countries. I'd like to mention here this theory of change framework from the Convention on Biological Diversity from UN Environment. And you can see here that animal welfare is not really mentioned. So we have here a theory of change to go from the loss of biodiversity that is jeopardizing human well-being and sustainable development, how we can implement different tools, solutions, threats, and meet people's needs, what milestones are necessary. And all of this is driving us to a vision, uh, according to the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is living in harmony with nature. Of course, nature has the environment and the plants and the trees, but also the animals. So whilst animals are not mentioned at all here, apart from maybe this fish that is here cooked, we have an implicit here. Animals are an intrinsic part of ecosystems. Animals are quite an important part of all the species and the genetic diversity. 
and animals are part of nature. So to live in harmony with nature, we must have the welfare of those animals present as well, not just the well-being of humans. So this is something quite important to reflect on when we look at the international sphere, how we actually see this, these frameworks created with a very much human-centric focus. And yes, we are taking into account ecosystems, species, but we still have a human-centric focus. And perhaps we need to start thinking about how we can make this approach more holistic and try to acknowledge that actually making improvements in those ecosystems, in those species, in those animals that live and make nature together, we can actually make improvements to, to the well-being of humans. So yes, food for thought, but I thought it was a very, very interesting approach, a, a great objective and vision to have to live in harmony with nature. And to me, this is really the essence of, of a one welfare approach. That's what, what living in harmony with nature means, is understanding and acknowledging that the welfare and well-being of every sentient being in the planet is interconnected. And this very same convention paper tells us that we must take urgent policy action globally, regionally and nationally. And this is required to transform economic, social and financial models. So it's not just a matter of doing research or changing the law or doing something different. It's really a full transformation of many different models and trends across the planet, which are exacerbating these biodiversity losses and affecting these connections with, with nature. So it's something quite powerful. And there is a lot here, a lot of work and change to do, which we all really need to think quite carefully about, because this really requires a systemic change across the globe. And this holistic approach is something that is slowly starting to happen, but perhaps looking at the dates here, not at the speeds that we, we should do it. So yeah, a point for reflection for all of you. I'll, Pass to the final part of my talk, which is really a summary of key international agencies and bodies that can help us to, to think and set frameworks on, on this uh, implementation of international law embedding the welfare of animals. So I will mention the World Organization for Animal Health, which was founded as the OIE, which we, many of you still will remember as a change in name has been fairly recent, just yes, May this year after the general session approval. But yeah, I'd like to mention their OIE Global Animal Welfare Strategy or the WOAH Global Animal Welfare Strategy, which was launched in 2017. And the vision for this strategy is very much a one welfare vision if you think about it. It's a world where the welfare of animals is respected in ways that complement and pursue the animal health, well-being, the human well-being and the socio-economic development and environmental sustainability. So very much this is adopting a one welfare approach to how this organization is looking at the welfare of animals. So something quite important to have present and to continue to remember when we look at those animal welfare standards that WOAH is creating. We have the Food and Agriculture Organization of United Nations, and I've mentioned some examples from them earlier. But I'd like to refer to you to a paper from 2008, which is capacity building to implement good animal welfare practices. And again, if you read this point two from the introduction executive summary, it is a one welfare approach. Many good animal welfare practices have multiple benefits for people as well as animals. So again, this is a powerful statement recognizing the interconnection between the welfare of animals and people. So the one welfare approach is being named but it's not something new. It has been embedded into many international organizations for years. What I have done through the One Welfare Framework, through the consultation I launched, is to put this into context, to name it, and to help us to identify all of these One Welfare areas that we really need to develop and, and, and adopt and, and implement really into international spheres and also at national and regional levels. We have the UN Environment Programme, and again, here we have a very recent resolution that was adopted in, on the 2nd of March, 2022, which is really looking at the nexus between animal welfare, environment, and sustainable development. And again, this is really helping us to adopt a one welfare approach. And this resolution is noting that the health and welfare of animals, sustainable development, and the environment are connected to human health and well being. So here we have the connection for health, which would be captured by the one health approach. But we also have that welfare and well-being interconnection, which is captured by the one welfare approach. So I'm very much looking forward to follow this, 
the development of, of the work following this resolution and see how this evolves and the evidence that is put forward together by, by those working in the report that this uh, resolution agreed to, to provide. And we have other examples published by the UN going back to the COVID um, theme that we have followed through this talk as, as an example to highlight international areas of, of welfare and mechanisms to, to embed animal welfare into law. And here we see the factors increasing zoonosis, zoonosis emerging. So we can see that this has very much a health focus, but it mentions deforestation and other land use changes. If we think of a forest, we have many different animals living in a forest. If we think how the forest is deforested, those animals are going to lose their habitats. The people undertaking the deforestation practices may be actually handling those animals, catching them, capturing them, doing things to them which would impact their welfare. So they are losing their, their, their home. They may be handled or treated in different ways. We have illegal and poorly regulated wildlife trade. Again, those animals and their welfare is going to be impacted. So you can see that here, animal welfare is not mentioned. We have a focus on health, but animal welfare is implicit to all. And that's why it is important to keep the presence of one welfare to ensure that we don't lose the focus on the welfare elements as well. The World Health Organization is very much a health focus, human health organization, and they publish as part of COVID the manifesto for a healthy recovery. And they publish uh, different prescriptions and actionables for a healthy and green recovery. And I'd like to bring your attention to those because again, if you go through the different prescriptions for a healthy and green recovery, we can see very clearly there is a one welfare aspect to all of them. So if we look, for example, let me just pick one here, uh, how we can protect and preserve the source of human health, which is nature. We know that nature is intrinsically connected to animal welfare, human well-being, as well as the environment. So there we have the connection to one welfare. So when we talk about this preservation of human health, we cannot look just at that on isolation. We really need to take everything else into context. We can look at the promotion of healthy and sustainable food systems. And again, if we look at those food systems, uh, we have really animal welfare and sustainable animal production as an intrinsic part of promoting sustainable food systems. So again, the well-being of those farming communities, of those livestock animals, and the environment they are in is pretty much an integral part of this prescription. So you can see how one welfare is really intrinsic to the prescriptions. So it's really positive that the World Health Organization has promoted this approach and, and suggested that we, we start using this type of prescriptions for a recovery, because they can be actually amplified and extended to, to adopting a one welfare approach and to embedding animal welfare as well. And then lastly, I would like to mention the World Trade Organization, and I know their colleagues will talk about trade later on in the day. But basically, this is pretty much an organization that focuses on trade, we know there are some conflicts across different countries, across different production systems, cultures, and there are differences. But what the, the organization establishes is that the member state can set the trade restriction when citizens are concerned with the welfare of animals. And there are some examples of this, which I will not go into detail, but I thought it was an important point because again, when we think on the context of the international setting, and how animal welfare is integrated and embedded if we use a one welfare approach, then this is an important point to remember and to explore and perhaps to develop and, and adopt more, more holistically and globally. So I'd like to finish with some final remarks, which I think are quite straightforward from the discussion we just had, and is that we must do everything possible to encourage collaborations about one health and one welfare between the different professionals and sectors to maximize social benefits. So this is not really a veterinary approach or a veterinary concept. This is very much a concept that applies to everybody, every profession, including, of course, lawyers, since this was organized by the Association of, of Lawyers for, for Animal Welfare. And global challenges must be tackled holistically. I think we have learned already that just using a tunnel vision and focusing on one element doesn't help us to, to actually solve global challenges. So it's important that we recognize those interconnections between animals, peoples, and the environment, and we truly implement the One Health and One Welfare approach. 
So I'd like to thank you all for those that would like more information. I've mentioned the One Welfare Framework book. There is also a YouTube channel where you can find information about One Welfare and different talks from the last conference we did on, on One Welfare, which introduced for the first time a, a science element to this. So there will be a number of, of papers and reports that you can find presentations for there. So I, I encourage you to, to have a look at that. And of course, our website. So, yeah, so I leave you with one of my places of, of peace and calm. I hope you all enjoyed the talk and I will be happy to take any questions outside of the conference in, in writing if any of you would like to, to send any through. Thank you very much to everybody and enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye-bye. <laughs>